Welcome, friends, to the uh, 11th PESIC Colloquium on Sustainable Agriculture. This colloquium honors the work of Dr. John Pesek, Iowa State University Emeritus Professor of Agronomy. Dr. Pesek's work in the areas of soil fertility and crop production led scientists to a better understanding of the effects of agricultural management practices on the environment and productivity. Dr. Pesek also addressed in considerable depth and breadth the challenges and diverse paths to agricultural sustainability. This series honors his lifelong commitment and contributions, and I am very pleased to welcome Dr. Pesek here tonight. My name is Matt Liebman, and I serve as the Henry A. Wallace Endowed Chair for Sustainable Agriculture and a professor of agronomy. Tonight, I'm very pleased to introduce Andrew Revkin, one of our country's most respected and influential writers focusing on environmental and sustainability concerns. Mr. Revkin's reported on the science and politics of climate change for more than 20 years. He was a senior editor of Discover, a staff writer at the Los Angeles Times, and a senior writer for Science Digest. From 1995 to 2009, he covered environmental issues for the New York Times, and he continues to write their Dot Earth blog, a widely read source of information on agriculture, energy, and sustainability issues. His work on the Dot Earth blog recently earned him a National Academy's Communications Award, a prize bestowed jointly by the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, and the Institute of Medicine. He's the first two-time winner of this award. He's also received awards for his work on climate and environment from Tufts University and the State University of New York's College of Environmental Science and Forestry. In 2007, he was given an honorary doctorate in humane letters from Pace University, where he's currently a senior fellow and lecturer in the Academy for Applied Environmental Studies. Mr. Revkin's work has taken him to the Arctic three times and in 2003 became the first New York Times reporter to file stories and photos from the floating sea ice around the North Pole. Based on his work in Brazil, he wrote The Burning Season, The Murder of Chico Mendes, and The Fight for the Amazon, which was the basis for an award-winning HBO film. He also wrote Global Warming, Understanding the Forecast, and for younger readers, The North Pole Was Here, Puzzles and Perils at the Top of the World. Mr. Revkin's articles have appeared in The New Yorker, Condé Nast, Traveler, The Christian Science Monitor, Rolling Stone, Newsday, and the Brazilian paper, O Global. Mr. Revkin's a master of multimedia journalism, including blogging, podcasting, videography, and photography, and he received an award of excellence in the Pictures of the Year International Competition in 2005 for his photo called Slope Study, in which a scientist wearing a headlamp trudges through a blizzard in the Alaskan wilderness. Mr. Revkin's visit to Iowa State University has been made possible by the work of Ms. Marsha Manier, and I want to thank her very much for all she's done. It's also been made possible by generous donations from the Bioeconomy Institute, the Graduate Program in Sustainable Agriculture, the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, the Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture, the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Organismal Biology, the Department of Natural Resource Ecology and Management, Practical Farmers of Iowa, the Greenlee School of Journalism and Communication, the ISU Committee on Lectures. On behalf of the PESA Colloquium Committee, I express my sincere thanks to all these organizations for their assistance and support. Please join me in welcoming Andrew Revkin to Iowa State University. Thanks. It's, uh, sorry, it's great to be here. It really is. I was here several years ago walking through a field, um, one of the experimental plots that uh, Matt has been working on, and, and I got to go back, actually, I want to see. I think it was a little greener when I was here. So I'm here to explore this question. Most reporters don't cover questions. They cover a beat, whether it's sports or Iraq or um, Wall Street or <laughs> Occupy Wall Street. And I cover this question. I, I, I settled on this after 20 years of writing about climate change, biodiversity, um, all the subjects that are grouped under this odd word sustainability. And then four years ago, almost to the day, I think it was four years ago, and it'll be about two, two or three days, I started this blog called Dot Earth. And initially it had this little uh, subtext line that said nine billion people plus one 
uh, planet equals what? And, e and it is an open question. One, one thing I do on this blog, which is very, very much different than what most blogs do, is I, I raise questions. I'm not there to bloviate. Uh, most of the blogosphere is, is shaped around uh, people's opinions on things. My opinion is that science matters. And it's a very strongly held, passionate opinion of mine. And on issues where the science leads you to complexity, the complexity is, matters. And anyone who's glossing over that is not doing society a favor, I even if it feels good sometimes. I think we have to get comfortable with complexity, and we have to get comfortable with uncertainty. And as I was talking to journalism students here earlier today, um, uncertainty in the scientific world is a form of knowledge. It gives, you're, you're articulating how much you know or don't know something. That's, some, that's actually useful knowledge. And in society, unfortunately, we think about uncertainty as an excuse to not do something or to put off something. And finding ways forward with language so that we can all have common meaning and, and, and integrate science in how, how we behave and not always put feelings first, which is our, our sort of tendency as a species we probably have a better chance of a somewhat smooth ride in this century. Now, this is the only lecture you'll hear that includes things like stroke, meaning you know cerebral stroke, um, earthquakes, and adolescence. That I feel is a good news story. Try to absorb that idea, and you, I think you'll you'll see what I'm getting at in a minute. But I do think we're poised for. Um, a wild and interesting ride. I think it's an amazing time to be alive on this planet. And uh, it's a very special time as well because with awareness comes responsibility, at least in theory. And as we've become aware as a species of our impacts, some of which are, the, are at the planetary scale, that kind of kicks back at us in ways that no other species that became a powerhouse on this planet ever had to deal with. So that's kind of a cool time to be alive, whether you're a scientist or a writer or in the arts or any other enterprise. So here's the question, and here's the deal. Um, this is kind of, whoop, hold on. Most of us have gone through some moment in the last few years that looks like this. This was a picture I took in Copenhagen at the end of the, those, the, the climate talks that resulted in this pledge, this sort of pledge of allegiance to nothing, the, the uh, Copenhagen Accords. And, and that photographer uh, was in a room full of, th of about 3,000 journalists, which my friend John Broder, who was there and covered many p presidential campaigns, he said at, at no political convention had he ever seen as much reporting uh, mass on, on display. And it was all, you know, for what? So it's easy to look at that and then to look at trajectories like this. This was a, a great cartoon by Steve Greenberg, who was a political cartoonist when newspapers had political cartoonists. There still are a few. Um, and he, of course, charts that familiar spike, one of the most familiar spikes we, we've seen. Of course, you know, we were kind of this dribbly species for hundreds of thousands of years, and then kaboom, something happened. And, you know, whether we get uh, close to the top of that spike is, it's probably, un it's unlikely that we'll hit 12 billion, even by the end of the century. But it's not out of the question. Just today in the New York Times, Joel Cohen had a really good piece um, laying out the knowns and unknowns about population change. And uh, I like this, you know, I think I can, I think I can, I hope I can, I really hope I can, man, I hope I can. It, it's articulating that feeling we all have as we look at these trajectories, whether you're looking at the w one for water or the one for car carbon dioxide emissions or the one just for numbers. And it's hard to look at that and say, we're gonna have, we're gonna come around this corner smoothly, but I think there is a decent chance. There isn't a decent chance if we all look like this on Black Friday. The, uh, you know, can you imagine nine billion people doing that? <laughs> this is uh, a Target store, you know, one of those, they open the doors and there's a big sale. And uh, boy, uh, it's some, something about that doesn't look sustainable on its face. And, uh, and, w and considering our predicament on this planet right now, I keep circling back to um, bacteria on a plate of agar, because it's kind of like so far, there are very few th indications that we are, and we are other than bacteria on agar which just go, there's a resource, and you just take it, and you eat it, and you reproduce, and you, and you grow, and you grow, and until either your own waste products or, or the lack of resources pushes you back. And uh, this is another image of agar, on, a, on a, a bacteria on agar. And what science has been revealing these last few decades, from my standpoint, is kind of like the edge of the Petri dish. In fact, there, it literally feels that way sometimes. When I, 
covered the IPCC reports these last 20 years, each time they would unfold a new one, you know, there would be the scientist, in this case, um, Martin Parry, standing in Paris in 2007, and you see the categories, health, coasts, food, ecosystems, and he's giving us this body of knowledge. And you know what comes through my head each time I look at this? So this is the adolescent part. It's kind of like we're the wayward teenager and he's the chiding father. Do you remember the scene in Rebel Without well, a Cause? You call? know what kind of drunken brawls those kind of parties turn into? It's not a place for kids. A minute ago, you said you didn't care if he drinks. He said a little drink. You're tearing me apart! We're kind of like that, you know, society is sort of like hearing all this stuff and not really wanting to hear it. And it reminds me over and over again of that scene in that movie. Uh, and the scene where, um, uh, oh gosh, what's his name? The father. Uh, he ha he's wearing a bib. Uh, he'd been cooking food, an apron, and, and uh, he, they go at it again. So uh, we are like an adolescent poised for adulthood. We've been in this uh, sort of fossil fueled, if you substitute fossil fuels for testosterone, you get that sense of where, where, we, where we've been at for the last 200 years. And the question is, what do we want to be when we grow up? And that's sort of that 9 billion plus 1 equals what question. And this, was, this actually got pretty concretized in the arguments in the Supreme Court uh, in 2006 over uh, should CO2 be uh, regulated under the Clean Air Act as a pollutant. And, and Justice Scalia had this really interesting interchange with James Milkey, who was representing Massachusetts, one of the states that was a plaintiff in the suit. And there was some confusion about you know, the, the layers of the atmosphere, and this played out. Uh, Milkey said to Scalia, respectfully, your, your honor, it's not the stratosphere, it's the troposphere. Justice Scalia responds, troposphere, whatever. I told you before, I'm not a scientist. Laughter. <laughs> That's why I don't want to have to deal with global warming, to tell you the truth. Now, it's easy to look at this, and if you're a liberal, to sort of chuckle at Scalia, some conservative Luddite. But there's a part of everyone in this room, probably, that doesn't want to really have to deal with global warming. Because it's so damn inconvenient. It's got all these attributes that make it the antithesis of the kinds of problems that humans deal well with. So that's, again, that feeling of the tension. You know, the, the teenager coming back after denting the fender on the car. The, the feeling of unease with... Um, with actions that are underway that you know are not sustainable, but you're not quite sure you're ready to sort of jump to the next level, to move from a sprint to a marathon pace. And I recently wrote a piece. Uh, there, was a, there was a cover story in National Geographic about the teenage brain. And when I was reading this piece about the teenage brain, I was thinking, and this gets to the optimism part, I was thinking about all the turbulence in the world right now outside of this growing body of information that's disturbing to us. But there's turbulence. There's a lot of things changing. There's uh, despots being overthrown. There's, there's tension. There's prospects of more terrorism. There's a lot of young, disaffected people in poor countries. And, and the wiring is explosively creating this infosphere that allows us to be aware of all of this at the same time. You go on the web and you're seeing Qaddafi's live video. And, and you're, you're seeing stuff from Iowa about corn prices, and it's just in your face. And what I feel, to some extent, and what you, what you read in the National Geographic article was that the wiring goes through a big change in the, in the human brain between adolescence and adulthood. There's actually a reboot that happens. There's stuff that ungrows and then regrows. And I think we're kind of, on a global scale, poised for that same transition. And I think the turbulence actually could be seen as our wiring kind of getting into, into a better phase to, to be determined. You know, we don't know, we don't know yet, but I think there's a decent chance. So, um, and I've gotten, as I've moved, see, I spent 25 plus years as a journalist and I came to academia a year and a half ago to, be, to, to become effective, right? How many of you, <laughs> the academics are supposed to laugh when I say that because, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people who don't feel very effective in academia. But maybe that just means that it's hard to be effective in any of these fields. But right now, right now, again, there's some special things going on in the planet that I think can create a wave of efficacy if we are attuned to them. And, what they are, and they're mainly associated with, with communication. They're associated with this networks that are being built. And it's not just Facebook. There's stuff, the ability to, to shape and share ideas has never been greater. And the positive potential, I think, greatly outweighs the negative, although both exist. And what you end up with is, is this kind of process. It's sort of a circular building process where you have edu education, communication, inspiration, which is the values component, and um, innovation, which is the changing the way so something works to make it better. 
the, pr the, po the prospects of this fast forwarding, I think, right now are really great, M mainly because of the stuff, of course, I'm biased toward communication. I'm a, that's what I do. But I do think that's where you'll see the greatest chance of, of really sort of speeding some, some, some progress, whether it's in agriculture or in uh, energy innovation or in areas like that. And there's a word for this that was invented in the 1930s by a couple of uh, guys, a theologian, Pierre, uh, Pierre uh, de Chardin, um, Teilhard de Chardin and, and uh, Vladimir Vernadsky, a Russian geochemist. And together they kind of cobbled this notion of newosphere which uh, is from the Greek, newest, newest for mind and sphere for, sphere for sphere. And it really basically means a planet of the mind. And, and they were articulating something that actually Darwin hinted at in The Descent of Man as well, that we're building the global communication and trade networks that we're building could be something that will help sort of sheath the planet in intelligence to create a collective intelligence, a collective ability to improve the world um, with the power of thought. And I've seen examples, and I'm going to show you some examples. This isn't just sort of pie-in-the-sky stuff that I think convey pretty effectively what I'm talking about. And one of them I became aware of shortly after July 1st when I had a little stroke, um, which, of course, I had to blog, being a, who I am. Uh, July 1st, I went running with my son, who's 21, had been in the military. We were running up a hill in the woods, and it was a hot day. And, and my left eye, on the way down the hill, I was really struggling. Um, was sending Paisley signals, and I knew the world wasn't Paisley, so I was, said, Daniel, something's wrong, let's go, let's go home, and we drove home, and I scarfed down a pile of baby aspirin, thinking maybe this was a stroke, and I kind of, some neuron had remembered that, and I went to the hospital, and I, I was actually, my treatment was delayed significantly. As it turns out, I'm, you know, I'm standing here, I, I lost the ability to type for about three weeks, I couldn't play my guitar, which was even worse. And, um, but I, you know, it all came back. I'm 90% back, but it could have been far worse. And then, as I've been doing reporting, both for this blog post that I did, and then I'm doing a, a longer piece on this, I became aware of the possibility now, and it's not just a possibility, it's happening routinely, of the world's best neurologists essentially being able to be in any emergency room like that at the speed of electrons. And I, uh, I did an interview with the inventor of one of the systems that allows this to happen, and I did it on the system. And so I'm talking with Dr. with Yulin Wang, who is, uh, where are you anyway? I'm in Santa Barbara, California. So you're in Santa Barbara, California, but I'm in, on Long Island and in the emergency room. Um, similar to the emergency room I was in in the Hudson Valley about two months ago. And boy, I would have liked to have had you there when I had my stroke. <laughs> Look at this thing. Is there any? Well, so if you could imagine here, even has Imagine a name tag. Imagine a patient laying there. Right. Um, you know, if you had a, a dedicated um, person holding a laptop all the time, you know, you could make certainly make some progress. But if you want to really have a, 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 an, a, you know, an interaction of clinical quality, you need something much better than a laptop in both the audio and the video, and then in this case, having the mobility access, which allows a very realistic interaction. And hopefully that's what you're sensing here. So, I, yeah. you, you know, unfortunately you can't see the image I see, but I see a very, very that's high quality here. image. In fact, I can put on this picture right here, <laughs> and then I can see how I can, I can zoom in on you, and you can yeah. see how close I can zoom into you. So you could see my, you could see my, Horner's, can, my Horner's syndrome when I had it, which was... Yeah, my, yeah exactly, Ex exactly. <laughs> So uh, that says to me, just think about that. You can take the expertise on an issue and get it to where it's needed at, at light speed. And in this case, you know, something like 90% of Americans who suffer strokes are, are mistreated, are not adequately assessed because of the lack of that simple ability to have the right person at the right place and time. This was a Friday of Fourth of July weekend, and you know, the neurologists were playing golf or whatever. And if, he had, if they had been able to be there virtually, I would have had the right anticoagulant therapy right away. And, and that's kind of, you know, gets under my skin because I see the potential. By the way, and guess, we're a little slow at adopting new ideas. We have to forgive ourselves, whether it's climate and energy or whether it's medicine. One of the big impediments to this becoming the norm is Medicare rules that require, if a doctor wants to get reimbursed, he has to be physically at your bedside. 
So some changes, these, sometimes administrative innovation is something that's needed as much as technological innovation. And you'll see, I'll be writing more about this, so stay tuned. Now, uh, in the media, you know, we had this, this was the norm that most of us grew up with, certainly me. And Cronkite would uh, sign off his show. In that this is my last broadcast as the anchor man of the CBS Evening News. And that's the way it is, Friday, March 6th, 1981. That's the way it was. And you see, every night we had this easy way of absorbing the world because someone just told us that's the way it is. We didn't have to actually think. We all had our little comfort food dinner, you know, our big communal mac and cheese dinner. Tens of millions of us across America, you, you had your choice of the Walter Cronkite recipe or the John Chancellor recipe, but basically we were fed a common meal. And now on an issue like climate, you know, you go out there and you've we're still all dining on comfort food, but now on the web and with uh, specialized cable TV and talk radio, you can, it's like the world's biggest buffet. So everyone gets their comfort food, but each one just, just takes his or her own choice. So we're sort of subdividing into little bubbles, which is good and bad. You see, there was a lot of complexity that was hidden behind that old model. And it, the front page of the New York Times uh, glossed over a lot of complexity as well. And now we do have to take on more of the work ourselves at trying to figure out how the world is. And a lot of that's going to have to happen outside of the traditional media, which is the thing that, uh, that drew me to academia, to find new ways to tell stories that are n not in the old simple mode, but that can probably, you know, can have some impact. So on Dot Earth, along with the stuff I write myself, sometimes I'll take a scientist who's in the field, like this, this guy, Andy, B Andy Bunn, from Western Washington University, he was in Siberia studying uh, paleoclimate, old climate records in the, in the uh, sediment of rivers and stuff there. And he filed, uh, he and his team of students filed, they sent me pictures and some audio clips and, and then I cobbled it into this, what I call a postcard on Dot Earth. It's not journalism, I'm not out there with a pad, but it's a way of conveying the science from the field directly to readers of the New York Times. So th those kinds of innovations still involve the, n the media, the newspaper, uh, the news paper, get rid of the paper part, the, the, the news medium, and, uh, but there's much more that's coming and that can happen. Universities can play a role directly in, in uh, telling the story of the science that their, that their um, faculty and students are doing as well. There's many ways to use graphics and to think creatively about ways to, to parse a story. We, you know, climate, global warming is always conveyed as this single phenomenon Global warming, and it has no meaning. That phrase has so little meaning because it has a different meaning to everybody. So when I, when I talk about it, I say, well, what do you mean? What's the thing that concerns you or the thing that you doubt? Is it about sea level or is it about the power of CO2? And, and I kind of created the, uh, this notion of that ideas have a shape. Phys you could actually sort of roughly approximate the robustness of a subcomponent of this thing called global warming. You know, more, more, warming, more CO2 equals a warming world, that's a very steep curve. There's, very, there's almost no variance. There's no little tails on this. Even Michael Crichton, when I interviewed him, agreed on the basic idea that greenhouse gases actually function. Uh, unfortunately for us as a species, the stuff that matters most to society actually is still highly uncertain. The pace of sea level rise, hurricanes, uh, tornadoes is even worse in terms of any understanding of how they relate to the changes that will come from greenhouse forcing. Regional climate forecasts are not going to get better anytime soon, and this climate, the best climate model is in the world will tell you that. And of course, the hardest thing of all is how, how warm is it going to get? So, so the warming from a doubling of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is about, we have about the same level of understanding of that as we did 30 or 40 years ago. It's refined to some extent, but it's still basically a lot of non-manufactured scientific disagreement. So it's a great, a great thing to do. If someone gets into an argument with you from either standpoint, any standpoint on, on global warming, make sure you stop, pause, and say, hey, let's just, let's get some common terms of reference. And that, whether you're in the media, conventional media, or just talking to your neighbor, I think there are ways forward on that. Um, and then there's some wonderful work underway in, in the sociological and psychological sciences to try to clarify the same thing. Where are, are there, uh, the, among all the, amid all the polarization on issues like energy and climate, there's actually a huge amount of agreement. Now there wasn't a lot of agreement on this idea of what was called a cap and trade bill. This was this study at Yale where they, these balls basically are 
chunks of American opinion on global warming and related issues. And as you can see from the labels, there was alarmed, concerned, cautious, disengaged, doubtful, and dismissive. These were the bubbles in 2009, and they've changed size somewhat, but this, that's not the main point here. The main point is, note, even in 2009, support for a cap and trade bill was marginal at best. Even the alarms, the ones who really worried about this, were just barely above the midline of supporting that idea. Now, when you look at support for providing rebates for purchases of solar panels and fuel efficient vehicles, even the dismissives on global warming were kind of like, you know, in the middle on that idea. Even though it's actually, you know, uh, if I'm a libertarian, the last thing I want is, is, you know, incentives, subsidies, that kind of thing. But you could see there's something to talk about there. And this one was the most interesting of all, I think. Support for requiring, regular requirement, 45 mile a gallon fuel efficiency across vehicle fleets, even at the price premium of $1,000. And look at that, even there, only the dismissives, the absolute you know, obstructionist rejection types were just below the midline, and everyone else has said this is a good idea. So I, I heard that Jonathan Foley spoke here last week, and he and I agree on this idea that you know, why fight that, that polarized, blockaded fight over terms that people don't even know, know what they're talking about, like global warming, when people in the room are actually talking about different things, when you can have a cogent, productive conversation on energy. It seems to me a no-brainer. And then this is a curve I'm just going to show you because it matters a lot to me. And it's, whoops. And it's, a, it's kind of a, a window on what we care about through the amount of money we as a country have spent on energy, on, on science, basic science, since Sputnik. This is all the basic sciences. So we got very worried about science and the lack of our understanding of it. When Sputnik happened and the Russians beat us into space, the yellow he bands here, several tens of billions a year were in constant dollars were the space race. So we cared about that. We got to the moon, and then we kind of finished that. The blue at the top is the war on cancer, and it had marginal imp eff efficacy, but we care a lot about health. So we went up to about 40 billion a year um, on health spending, and that's now declining a little bit. But you, that gives you the sense of what we care. When we care about something, we study it hard. Energy is that sort of green anaconda in the middle there that we cared about in, during the oil crisis in the 70s, and then it, we just dribbled away. And, and the dribble, do you see any sort of partisan aspect to the dribble? Like, was there a Democratic uptick, Republican downtick? No, we just completely, we had a bipartisan slumber party on energy science. And uh, over here is the, uh, here's the stimulus. And of course, you know, that's all gone, right? That was a one-time blip right there. Now it's going to be down here. Does that look like an energy revolution to you? Not to me, no. So now I'm going to, that's like, again, sort of get, taking you down a little bit. And you know we're not going to have any agreement uh, for years to come on big spending initiatives, whether they're on, for science or for, uh, you know, incentives for wind turbines or whatever. It's not going to be there. So what do you do when that's not going to be there? Well, I turn back to what I started to talk about, which is the use to use information to fast forward progress, to get ideas where they're needed and to shape ideas through common discourse. And that's this back to the newosphere. And with a little adjustment, you could call it the noosphere. There's a guy named Larry Killam who's an inventor who um, he and I both sort of stumbled on this phrase as a way to build a glossier word around this Greek weirdness. And you know, the last thing the world needs is a new word. But uh, for some reason, I'm kind of stuck on it for the time being. So what is this? this is, the way I envision it is that universities particularly, but schools generally, become engaged in conversation, in discourse, in collaborative work, both within campuses and then across between campuses to build a better world. You can, and and this is, you'll see how this can work. Thomas Berry, who I, whose obituary I got to wrote for the, write for the New York Times, and who was a remarkable thinker in many ways, who bridged the theology, science gap in, in interesting ways, he said, he pointed to the opportunity and responsibility the universities hold specifically in this arena. When he said, I propose that the religious, the religions are too pious, the corporations too plundering, the government too subservient uh, to corporations, these universities, however, should have the insights and the freedom to provide the guidance needed by the human community. There's a unique moment here 
when there's no government money flowing, when technology can move an idea at light speed, when universities, uh, at Pace University where I work, is very much about practice, about testing ideas and interacting with the community around you, give you that great sense of uh, a special moment. And the technology, yeah, look, we've got Match.com for people to get together to, to share and shape <laughs> things other than ideas. But now, and you've seen uh, online, I don't know if you've seen experiments like Scientists Without Borders, which is through the New York Academy of Sciences, um, Innocentive, which is sort of a money-making venture. Someone wants to solve a problem that could make money, and who has the idea, and then you share, those, you share the skills, and you all profit. Um, global giving is a way to uh, sift uh, for the most efficient and interesting uh, nonprofit organization that you want to send money to. But that's, that's, that's money. That's easy. What I want to see universities do to fill this gap is to share skills. And students are a big part of this, as you'll see. S students have extraordinary skills and with technology can, can play as meaningful a role as anybody else out there in getting good ideas where they need to go. So, so there's a couple of conventional sort of PowerPointy slides here because I couldn't think of a better way to distill this down. Schools are a hub. They're a physical hub in the place. They relate to the farms around them. And where I live in the Hudson Valley, they relate to the open landscapes and suburban communities and the city. They, uh, they, they're a place where people learn uh, about things like sustainability, where communities gather, like we are here right now, uh, to, to collaborate, invest, and care where the future is on display through the youth, um, where hopefully the, the students are interacting with students down the pipeline of you know, in secondary uh, and elementary level, places to share ideas and to have discourse. <laughs> places to learn. I love this video. I'm showing it to you That was uh, my wife. Uh, she's not a science teacher now, but she was for a long time in middle school. And they did that classic build, bridge building exercise where the kids had to take balls of wood and you know, come up with their own designs and put weights on them until they break. Uh, and she and her co-teacher, Mike Topchik, who you saw there, um, added a very special uh, innovation in the way they taught that course, where the students had to buy with virtual money the wood on a budget. And they were graded not just on durability, but on, on cost, be it was cost benefit. They had to weigh costs and benefits as they were building their bridges. And they got special, you know, if they built a fairly strong bridge cheaply, that counted a lot. And just think how, how that kind of learning experience or working, uh, you know, as a young uh, student in education, developing exercises that can teach students, those young students at that age, those ki the kinds of skills. And they can do it. I'm just going to show it again because it's just so cool. Wow. Watch, listen to the kids. You know, you, you can teach to the test as much as you want, but you're not going to get kids yelling <laughs> like that. Um, so the physical school does all these wonderful things as well. And in developing countries specifically, you have this incredible potential where the school is a place you learn hygiene, you learn the, pow the, the power of just washing hands is extraordinary. You learn um, healthful habits. You can, you can at, a, at a f the physical school, there are places in Africa where um, some researchers at Columbia University uh, tested out a, a system where uh, the kid would bring a battery, like a battery-powered light thing to school, to charge it at school and bring it home and do the homework at home. Kind of neat. It's already been leapfrogged by other stuff, but it shows you the potential of the school to be a hub. And of course, as I say here, you know, in the last line, saving money. Learning, schools can demonstrate technologies. They're laboratories for things that can be uh, applicable in the broader community. Uh, Harvey Mudd College does a regional landscaping clinic that I think is a great example of the school, again, demonstrating what anyone with a uh, water-stressed environment can do to uh, use indigenous plants or just plants that function well in a certain uh, ecosystem. The school, and th this is something I care about, I just wrote about over the weekend because of what happened in Turkey. There are, there are thousands of schools in this world that are run away from places instead of run to places when something bad happens. And, um, that's a travesty. Just think about it in, in Sichuan province when, uh, where I, I, had, I wrote about the earthquake that happened there. I've written about the, earth, earth, uh, the series of bad earthquakes that have happened in recent years and how schools are particularly vulnerable. And it just drives me crazy to think that 
if you're going to care about one building in a, in a place, what's the building you want to bolster? It's the school because it's, it's so important to your future as well as your, um, the present. So um, I've been focused on designs that can improve prospects for schools standing up to disasters. And this is a, this is a typical school. I just want to, I'm going to back up just so you can see that. When I was in junior high, I went to a building that looked like this. You know, it had a half wall, a lot of windows, and it's not a good design to have in an earthquake zone, especially if it's multi-story. And these are how many kids are in earthquake zones in, around the world. Each one of these big bubbles is 10 million. This is a Mexico City, a school pancaked. This is a Taiwan pancake school. And here's a pancake building uh, yesterday in eastern Turkey. So you think, okay, this is something we should not be doing. This, dem my, this demonstrates the problem. Those weak spots, it's a little simplistic. My 21-year-old son made that animation. <laughs> but you get the idea. The same, now here's what's cool. Here is what's cool. The same materials configured slightly differently create a fundamentally more durable building. This was a, a test at, um, at um, Purdue on a shake table of a three-story building built with the bricks and, and the columns just configured slightly differently. And you end up with a really, you can have a beautiful design for a school. So same materials, same cost, and a much more durable outcome in, a, in, a, in, a, in an inevitable um, earthquake. Where's the downside? What's missing there? All that's missing is the knowledge. And so who's good at conveying knowledge? This, this school in front of me and the school I, I teach at. Universities can help to make sure this gets around. It, there are organizations now, and I wrote about this just yesterday on Dot Earth. There's the Open, Open Architecture Network, which is through the um, Architects for Humanity, which is trying to get a, develop a way using the web to get information on building designs where it's needed, sustainable building designs. And I think, again, the potential is just being scraped. We're just getting going on this. The network school, this is where you build out from the things you can do physically on campus, is where you can share those experiences and have collaborative learning. Uh, students here and students in, um, in Iran and, or students in anywhere in the world can have a collaborative experience now, and that ha has no downside as far as I can tell. And you know, the extension, think, this is really the, we're talking about the ultimate extension, extension, extension service, when what we're talking about is having that ramification, like a hub and spoke system for making ideas get to where they need to go. And when you think about the history of our own exten extension services and cooperative agricultural education and how that can be applied and is being applied in some parts of the developing world, you can see the great potential there too. And I'm sure people here are involved in developing countries getting going in those kinds of uh, practices. And then there's these, as I was saying, co-learning. There's this uh, nonprofit in um, England called Atlantic Rising. And it's basically an educational um, network. These young British uh, men and women go around to schools around the Atlantic, and from Ghana to Scotland to Nantucket, as you can see, Belize, Costa Rica. And what they're doing is exercises uh, related to coastal vulnerability and a, and a cl changing climate. And it's an, I saw their presentation in uh, Nantucket, and it's, it's non-judgmental, non it's not scary, it's not preachy, it's just let's go to the beach and see what three feet of sea level rise looks like. And here's, this, is, this was them in Nantucket where I caught up with them. You know, they're just uh, getting a sense, they're, they're integrating into how they're looking at their communities, what it would mean to have sea level rise in the range that we're talking about for the next century. And I think that's a great thing. And then the other thing they do is along those lines, they have schools interact with each other. There were students in Ghana and Scotland who are Skyping to each other now. So they're having video learning experiences where they're sort of co-learning together. And I think that's a wonderful thing as well. Now it's important to pause here and, and recognize that not all the world is on the web yet. That there is a, a really gaping, uh, there's so many divides in this planet right now in, in wealth and in technology and in access to the web. These kids, I've put this photo on my blog now about five times since it first was taken by an AP photographer several years back. And these are kids in, in uh, Guinea living outside the capital in slums. And to do their homework, they have to go to the airport parking lot because that's the only place where there's lights. And that, this picture really gets, my, gets at me because these are kids who are in school. They're the ones who are eager to learn. They're trying to advance their lives. And they have to walk 
through a dark slum to get to the light to do their homework. And in this 21st century, it just doesn't feel right that this, that, that can happen. And it's not, not, none of this is, you know, this isn't always something you can do something about easily. Governance issues, there are all kinds of issues related to electrification in poor places, but it's, it's a travesty. There's another important thing about this picture. There's something missing in it. I'm sure someone here can see. There's no girls, right. And of course, um, as you all know, if you want to have a trajectory for humanity toward the lower end on the population scale, uh, having girls educated and, and moving forward in their uh, understanding of how the world works and how family planning can work, um, you have a better chance of a smooth ride in this century. Now, that's the dark side. The light side is that even in some of the least empowered places, literally, there's amazing progress happening. A tiny little, frankly, crappy solar panel. This is like a $60 Chinese-made panel that is probably going to break. Maybe it's already broken. This picture was taken in December for a story by one of my colleagues and friends, Libby Rosenthal, in rural Kenya. This is a woman who ha she already had a cell phone, but she was tired of having to go into town to charge it up, uh, paying a ridiculous rate for each watt hour that she would put into that little battery from some merchant. And so she bought one of these panels. She saved up, bought the panel. And not only was she then able to char charge her own phone, she was able to have lights for her kids to do homework at night without having to go to the equivalent of the airport parking lot. And she, was, she set up a little business where she was charging her neighbor's phones at a rate far less than the, the guy in town. And then the good news, and this is what happens magically and so fast, is her neighbors are now buying their own panels and putting her out of business. But you can see how the power of a, just a tiny dribble of electricity in places that don't have any is, is extraordinary. And it shows you the potential we have to fast forward progress on this planet. Now, just to give you, and I was talking with um, Tom earlier tonight about this graph. This shows you the pace of change and the, the wiring that's underway, even though it's wireless, largely, but the, the connectiv connectivity that's spreading on this planet. Um, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, there were only 700 million cell phones on the planet. And most, about two thirds, were in rich countries, the blue. Now there's five billion cell phones on the planet as of last year, and three quarters of them are in developing countries. Of course, probably mostly in China, and mostly then in India. And then, but there's a huge uh, expansion of cell phone connectivity in Africa. And what this means is that that kid sitting under that um, there, you know, you've got Khan Academy in here broadcasting on the web all these fantastic little courses on how to do everything you can imagine, from reading Shakespeare to, uh, to doing electrical engineering, we're, we're creating the, really a global classroom at the speed of light. And it, though it won't be long before the, th the phone in those houses is a smartphone. You know, it's going to take some time, but it's going to happen. And that tells me, again, we're poised for some, some really great transitions. Now, I want to circle back to um, earthquakes, which have been a preoccupation of mine to give you one more vision, vista, one more sort of view of how this can play out. I was in Istanbul in 2009 to report a conventional news story for the New York Times on um, the next great earthquake that will damage that city. And if anyone doubts Istanbul will get hit by another great earthquake, you just look at the art. This was in 1509. And there's artwork that evolves over time. There's actually a guy in the Czech Republic, I think it is, um, who has a collection of earthquake art. And he's got all these like woodcuts and paintings that show you the history of Istanbul's earthquake disasters. And you can see the art kind of evolve, but the situation is always the same. It looks just like that. So I was there, and I went into this slum, uh, a really poor part of Istanbul, where people were uh, organizing into search and rescue teams just to practice, to be ready when the earthquake comes. And uh, similar to the experience in uh, some of these parts of Africa, I was there walking around. <laughs> We're doing the reporting, and these kids are all coming up to me. And, you know, kids, when they see a guy with a pad and some cameras, they're always like, you know, American or whatever. These kids, you know what they were saying? Facebook? I kid you not. And they didn't have any computers. But at, this, um, at this community center, they had access to computers, and they were all on Facebook. And now a bunch of them are my, are my, are my friends on Facebook. And then, of course, I was watching what they were playing. Some of them were playing Farmville, and my 
my 13-year-old son back in Garrison is playing Farmville, and I'm thinking, whoa, you know, if with a, an efficient translation interface, it's a matter of moments before kids around the world are essentially collaboratively playing. They can be playing, there's a disaster uh, game um, that the UN has developed that's a fascinating little what-if game. There's um, Minecraft, which my son is now, Minecraft? Yeah, my 13-year-old son is, is immersed in Minecraft. And actually, I want to interview uh, Notch, the guy who invented this game, because he's already added weather, but I want him to add climate, meaning you know, big changes. And I want him to add earthquakes, so the kids have to design buildings that are robust instead of just sort of building these fantastical constructions. And, and I think we're, again, we're poised to have some really wonderful learning opportunities uh, in new ways that we've never imagined before that could have these kids uh, interacting creatively with uh, our kids. And when I, you know, when I was 13, this is how I interacted with my pen pal in, in West Cameroon. And just, you know, my, I, there was a lot of power in that. Now, maybe it was powerful because it was hard. Um, I had to write, you know, I'd write him a letter. Alf I, I remember his name, Alfred Iwani. And, you know, I'd wait weeks, and then this crinkly envelope would come in the mail from him, you know, two or three weeks at later, and then I'd send him another one. And another, and, and now it's, it's all can be done face to face. Uh, there's so many uh, even uh, digital uh, video interfaces now where kids can interact. And again, you know, that's, that on itself, that in itself will not save the world because a lot of it will be just blather or even mean spirited stuff can happen that way. But with, with motivation, in, in inspiration, and, the, and some kinds of education, I think you can end up building the, the sort of the positive side of this. Uh, so it'll far exceed the negative. And at Pace University, we've been, we're one of, well, many schools are now trying to experiment with ways to get into the communication uh, world and make a difference. Uh, when I joined the faculty a year and a half ago, I started co-teaching in a, a, a very well-established course where the students on their spring break e each year, instead of going to Cancun and sitting on the beach, they go somewhere and make a film. Uh, they've gone to the Netherlands, they've gone to Costa Rica to do a film on ecotourism. And when I went with them last year, I convinced them to go do a film about sustainable shrimp farming. This is, there's experiments in Belize, not, actually not experiments now, there are well-established practices of uh, low-impact shrimp farming where the water never leaves the shrimp farm. It just goes from one pool to the next and back. So you're, you're not really doing the degradation of ecosystems, the nutrient overload and all that stuff. And we wanted to focus on this amazing woman, Linda Thornton, who I'd heard about for years who actually came from the Midwest of, the, of this country a long time ago and just wanted to be, she wanted to shrimp farm, moved to Belize and slowly uh, developed the skills to do it. And it was a great story. And these are kids, none of these students were environmental science students. They were there just to, as communication students. And they've come out of that course having built this film with an awareness of what sustainability means because they've seen it up close and they've had to tell its story. And I think there's, again, untapped potential there and here's just some of the scenes that, uh, that they recorded. This is, they, the, the food for these shrimp is very carefully weighed out. It's not just dumped into the pond. And uh, they, we had to figure out on, on the run, one of the, kid, one of the students had to figure out how to shoot one of her, uh, the only camera that we could shoot through the microscope to catch the shrimp larvae was, um, was a uh, phone, you know, a phone oh, camera. Actually, good. Yeah. Listen. Oh, they are. Well, anyway, she was very excited when we got the shot. And there's something about that excitement that reminds me so much of the kid screaming about the bridge. When you can have students you know, doing the innovation, and testing ideas and testing ways to communicate in the field on stories that make a difference, I think you can really build a culture, of a motivated culture of telling the story and then living the story, fitting our aspirations on this planet. And there's this thing called Twitter. You know, Twitter can be whatever you want it to be. It can be, I'm brushing my teeth now, or it can be, um, there's a professor of bird biology at, at University of Connecticut, Marianne Rubega, who, um, if you search on Twitter for that hashtag, for those who know what a hashtag is, you'll see her class, they're required to tweet every time they see bird behavior. <laughs> so they have to look at the physical world, the actual biological world, and do a digital translation of it <laughs> in a tweet. So, and she, this, this professor has found that by engaging them through this device that they're so locked into already, they're much more aware of the actual physical 
analog world around them and keeping track of bird behavior and bird sounds because of that channeling that she required. So th that's just one experiment of how this can work. On my, I just launched a new course this, this fall called Blogging a Better Planet. And if you want to search for it, uh, you go to twitter.com and you put this term in the little search box and you'll see um, stuff that we're saying and, and, and reading. And it's a way for us to convey, even as we're learning in our little classroom, to have a conversation with the wider world as well. So there's, there's again, lots of potential to use these technologies to make the world a better place. And getting back to the collaborative thing and the match.com thing, I was at a meeting of the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, this February, and there was a meeting, a session on, of teachers and educators on what teachers, what science teachers need. And one of the things they need is little one minute videos, just introductory videos about basic concepts in science. And I thought, oh my gosh, well, there's all these students out there, like my son doing the special effects -y thing, who could fill that need? And the students could do it by, and learn in the process. Professors can vet it to make sure it's accurate. And teachers struggling to, to teach kids in crowded, uh, underfunded, harried situations have something to play with. And so I'm trying to figure out ways to build this noosphere so that that teacher can essentially say to the world, hey, I need, I need a little explainer on gravity. And someone's student uh, in, a, in a visual arts co course at a university can cobble something together and get it out there. And someone else can say, hey, that's not quite right. And, but the next, within a week, you'd have this thing and you'd be helping facilitate science education. Now here's one that some students in California did Today on, waves of the future. on geoengineering. A closer look at geoengineering. What is geoengineering? Well, geoengineering is something global, intentional, and unnatural. And we've got some smart fellers figuring out new methods. Let's look at a few. Space mirrors. In this lifelike reenactment, Eric is the sun and Patrick is the Earth. As Patrick orbits Eric, he receives some of Eric's solar radiation, making Patrick very warm. Let's see what Patrick has up his sleeve. By deploying space mirrors, Patrick deflects some of Eric's warming radiation, making himself comfortably cool. I earn near the Galapagos. This is a scale model of the ocean. You get the idea. So here's another. Fracking is a form of natural gas drilling, an alternative to oil, because the oil kept spilling, bringing jobs to small towns, so everybody's willing. People turn on the lights, and the drillers make a killing. Water goes into the pipe, the pipe into the ground. The pressure creates fish at 7,000 feet down. The cracks release the gas that powers the town. That will frack. Yeah, totally frack. But there's more in the water than just H2O. Toxic chemicals help to make the fluid flow. With names like benzene and formaldehyde, you better keep them far away from the water supply. The drillers say the fishes are a mile below. The groundwater pumped into American homes, but don't tell it to the residents. Of Sublet Wayo, that water's frack. We're talking benzene. What the frack is going on with all this fracking going on? I think we need some facts to come to light. So, what's interesting about that, if you play it all the way through, and I blogged on it, is it was non judgmental in the end when you actually look at the content, it was all accurate. And it, the, concluding, the concluding point of this video was. We don't know enough about what's happening with this process, that, that, that the EPA study is important and finding out more. It wasn't like uh, some frantic no fracking thing. And that I thought was very valuable because there's a whole audience for this that will never read a paper or, or think about this issue. And maybe this got into some heads of some young people in a way that got through their barriers and made them a little bit aware of the actual facts of this process so you can have a cogent discussion. It's been seen on YouTube uh, more than 200,000 times, which is far more than, I've only had a couple of my videos that have gone more, th more than that. So, and it was done by students at NYU. And it's what's called, in journalism, that's called an explainer. It's like if there was a big earthquake, then you have a little sidebar that's an explanatory piece. It, this, it was this fissure in the ground, and it was this kind of quake, blah, blah, blah. So that's an explainer too, and as you can see, they have a website, explainer.net. So these kids are, I keep calling them kids, <laughs> they're young, young men and young women. They're, they're filling a gap that I think uh, the major media are not, and that I think could, could be, again, built on 
as a model for uh, new ways for universities to have some real impact in the world. And now I'm going to just quickly touch on one of the other great facets of the web, which is this thing called multimedia. And it, it's easy to look at this ar the arena and say, well, it's all just kind of gloss. But, when, but neural science has shown us that the brain actually absorbs things different ways, depending on whether how it's experiencing. So this is the brain seeing words, hearing words. See, see it's different parts of the brain. Thinking about words. So, you know, if you're trying to convey something complicated, if you're only showing people text, you're actually missing all that cognitive potential that's going to waste. So why not make sure it's the whole package? And, and one thing that's really interesting in this area is it's not just pretty pictures. You can actually convey uh, quantitative idea concepts uh, using imagery in ways that we're just, again, beginning to experiment with. So, and this is all about showing versus telling. Here's a, here's a very simple question. What's the volume of the atmosphere of the planet if it, all the air was at sea level pressure? And you could, I could explain to you in cubic miles or cubic kilometers what that is, or I could show you uh, this drawing, this image that was created by Adam Neiman, a British uh, science illustrator. That, that's the volume of the atmosphere at sea level pressure. And it says to me that you know, as we head toward 9 billion people, we have some pretty finite piece of atmospheric real estate there to, to apportion or to think about. And I think it's a good way to start any kind of discussion about pollution issues or uh, equity issues generally. So, uh, and here's a quiz sometimes I give to students. Uh, if all the world's liquid water was shown as a spherical volume, how big would it be compared to the planet? It would be big enough to obscure the US, big enough to obscure South America, big enough to hide the northeastern states, big enough to hide Iowa or Texas. Um, well, here, here, there it is. So that's all the world's liquid water. And of course, if it was just the fresh water, you wouldn't even see it. The bubble would be too small to actually see. So, and again, this is not, it's not judgmental. It's not, woe is me. It's just a way to start a conversation on water that I think is a useful starting point, especially when you move to talk about fresh water being such a limited portion of what you see there. So as I said earlier, Darwin actually came up with a new aspheric idea in his book, The Descent of Man, a long time ago. As man advances in civilization, small tribes are united in larger communities. The simplest reason would tell each individual that he ought to extend his social instincts and sympathies to all the members of the same nation, though personally unknown to him. This point being once reached, there is only an artificial barrier to prevent his sympathies extending to the men of all nations and races. And in this book, he went on to talk about animal welfare, by the way, animal rights, animal welfare, in the sense that uh, the other, the next journey, step in that journey of sort of consciousness would be toward more uh, consideration of the needs of the um, animals we rely on. So it's an interesting and a powerful concept. There's been this long sort of delineation of this prospect of a collective intelligence. So far, we're still mostly like the bacteria on agar, but I think we're poised for some marvelous things to be happening. And I'm going to close out with um, another bit of this, another important element, which is the arts and um, considering the values issues. You know, remember, science just delineates the, the, the stage that we act on, and it's our values that shape the decisions that we make based on scientific findings. This was um, a remarkable um, image caught by a Japanese satellite that's sort of like a um, version of the Earthrise photo, but it's a video. And it's just, to me, a stunning way to remind ourselves of the finite and not fragile, but definitely finite nature of this planet that we live on. And you see the sterile shoulder of the moon in the foreground, it just kind of gets to you. And the earth set is particularly powerful. The music here was by a bandmate of mine.
So thank you for listening. I'm, I hope there's time for questions. I'm happy to explore these ideas with you. This was that, that last image from uh, one of the Viking spacecraft uh, leaving the um, confines of the solar system, which I'm sure you read about Carl Sagan writing about this wonderful moment. And this is, so that's where we are, and this is where I am. So I'm happy to be in touch with you all. Thank you. I think there's a microphone. We, yeah, we have a live mic right here, and uh, we'll take some questions. And I could blog, I could blog the, what we discussed. Yeah. And uh, following the questions, we'll have some refreshments in back. So. Fire away. Uh, try one more time. Maybe the. Uh. Okay. Okay, it's on. I wanted to um, return, I think, to that slide by Thomas Berry. You quoted uh, corporations being too plundering, governments yeah. being too subservient and that it was essentially schools we had to look to for thought leadership to solve these problems. My question is, um, given the amount of thought and effort that does go into things like the World Food Prize, Global Harvest, corporations developing um, new methods for precision agriculture and getting more, um, it just, I could go on and on, and you're nodding. Yeah. Don't, you, don't you think that we're wasting cognitive potential if we throw all that out and say, well, we're not going to look to them. They're too plundering? Oh, I, I, you know, I don't agree with everything Thomas Berry said. Um, I, I think corporations are a vital part of the path forward, uh, both through the, the prosperity that they create, which is, allows us to do all of these things. I, I did a piece recently on, you know, if you care about the environment, you better care about the economic troubles we're having because you can't do anything about the environment if we're going to be in a perpetual state of struggling in the economy. So, um, in fact, when I, if you go back to that noosphere list of places that universities can partner with, companies are part of that list too. So I think you're making an important point, and I, I just want to be sure you understand that I don't toss out the corporate world because of Thomas Berry's uh, sort of tossed off comment there. Okay, thank you. Sure. And by the way, on my blog, you'll see some reinforcement for what I've said. No other questions. Oh, no, here we go. I'm a school teacher, and I want to make some comments about education. I developed a process to teach any kid that can add correctly how to do division, multiplication, fractions, decimals, percents, and basic algebra in less than five minutes. All you have to do is add correctly, and it takes three lines of notebook paper. Yet when I try to explain this to people in that field, their eyes glaze over. Do you have a website? Well, I, not yet. You should. That's and, see, that's the kind of thing that would could go viral on the I know on the web. You do, you want to do an end run around? When I talk to teachers about it, their eyes glaze over. Yeah. I also developed a process to teach the infinity of English sentence structure in a 12-step. Wow. Yes or no. 135 word process. All you have to do is say yes or no to these 135 words or concepts. I think you need to create it. You, you need to take my blogging course and create a blog. You can <laughs> do the infinity of English sentence structure. And the thing is, you don't have to know a word of English when you start. And I've used it for years to tutor international students in it. And, you know, when you talk Good. to that, and it's based on, I hate to tell you this, it's based on quantum physics. And that scares English teachers and physics professors. <laughs> so go to blogger.com. And in five minutes, you can create a blog. Okay. And then, and then go to YouTube, and you can, you can create videos explaining yeah. your process. It's, and it's very simple. And just put it out there, and then yeah. let people have at it. Some people will tear you apart or try, and others will defend you and spread the, the gospel of what you're yeah. talking about. And it, it could well, actually could be very uh, effective. I get asked to go to other countries. I've been to Russia teaching the Good. Czech Republic, the Ukraine, and Guam, and Taiwan. If you so send me an email, revkin at gmail.com, I'll okay. send you some advice. Thank now. you. I may be doing my course as an online course, the, the blogging I, course. So. I appreciate the value of your comments about education. Okay, good. Thank you. You did an excellent job. I was born in 1931. 
milk cows by hand, pick corn by hand. If we got 60 bushel acre corn, that was really great. And now we're 80 years away from when I was born. Do you think the next 80 years will be like the last 80 years? <laughs> the one thing I know about the next 80 years is anyone who thinks they know the way it's going to play out is handing you a crock of something. <laughs> it's going to be very exciting, let's put it that way. Um, I w and I remember uh, when I went to the North Pole in 2003, I was out there on the sea ice drifting with these scientists and I had my satellite phone. I called my grandmother who was, um, she was close to 100. She was in her late 90s. And I was speaking to my grandmother from the North Pole, and she basically remembers Admiral Perry and all that stuff from early, in, remembered from early in the 20th century. And her, and, and she was, she was so, it was so normal that all she could say was, are you wearing a hat? <laughs> <laughs> but it, I was having a, converse, a normal conversation with my grandmother from the North Pole in seven, eight years ago. It's just astonishing to think how things have changed. And, it, uh, and we, one thing we forget is how much change can you, f you can fit into a few decades. So looking forward, there's been that one, one pre, pre uh, one, I think the environmental movement recently has been too caught up in thinking that we know the whole, we have to know the whole answer to global warming right now. And there's, there's been a, an unwillingness. There was a guy I, I wrote about recently who teaches in Texas who talked about needing to have the courage to fear. In other words, we have to have the courage to admit we don't know all the steps in this chain. That, that, that's why a comprehensive climate bill was never going to be a, a sol realistic solution. You have to have a learn and adjust process. We have to have faith that the successors that we are leaving will play their role in, in innovating forward to smooth our, our journey on the planet. And one thing I think we've lost is that faith in the future. And um, I think this, and again, what I want to do is just expand our potential through these kinds of networks that we can build to build the resilience and the adaptive uh, awareness and the intelligence of young people so that they can do that. Hi. Um, I'm interested in the way that you incorporated values, because I think that oftentimes they can be sort of a blockade to our progress or, or you know, a stumbling yeah. block when we don't consider them effectively enough. And you, you included values under the piece on inspiration. And I'm wondering how you see that, that link, how you see speaking to people's values through inspiration. And then I sure. also am wondering how you think we address values or speak to people's values on the net. Because I think that sometimes... On the, on the net? On the, yeah. Through, through these, you know... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, one, one, of the, um, is one of the vital things for scientists to do, particularly in engaging in dialogue on something like global warming or how to feed the world, is to, to talk about the science in one sentence and then to stop, pause, take a breath and say, and I'm also a parent or a grandparent or whatever, and here's what I feel about it. Too often there's been a, a tendency to put that all in one sentence essentially. Um, this was Al Gore's approach and I think it backfired on him in the end. Climate is a crisis, here's the science and this is what you should do about it. And that made it impossible for a certain chunk of society to accept the science because it was attached to Al Gore's values and his approach to problems. So, so that's one thing I think is vital. And that's also on the web. Most of the disputes about global warming are not about the science. They're about the interpretations that we bring to the science based on our predispositions, on our values. So just getting clearer about that I think is really val valuable <laughs> as a starting point. Um, on the blog I write about this all the time. And the one thing that is clear also from history is that if we just focus on technology, just focus on innovation, without considering the ethical, the, the, the um, values laid inside of the question, then you don't necessarily end up with a very good planet. I did a piece two or three years ago, what if we had the perfect energy technology? Suppose one of the great innovators out there right now, Nate, Lu Nate Lewis, who I'll be with tomorrow, um, at, who's from Caltech, uh, or someone comes up with the perfect thing. It's like, it's like saran wrap, you put it on everything and it, it generates boundless electricity with no environmental impacts, okay? Some mystical stuff. Does that make the world sustainable on its own? No, because it, it greatly empowers us to do all the other stuff that might harm the world. We could 
We can, you know, pave over everything. We can uh, mechanize the world with boundless electricity. We can have a probably really good life, but we'll be, what kind of mix of wild and managed landscapes do we want? Those are values questions, not scientific questions. So just getting, making sure that both things are in consideration, I think, is important. And then splitting them apart so that you can have a cogent con conversation about the science and then say, these are my values, is also a, a crucial step. Hi there. Uh, I'm 18 years old, so I've never known a world without the internet. I've grown up with it and all of the things that go along with it. Um, I'm intimately familiar with it and very comfortable using it and all of the little things that I've grown up using. Technology is not a problem for me. But my mother has a great deal of problems when she starts to try and use anything like that. Yeah. And I was kind of wondering what your... Um, views on older generations using technology were. Um, it took me forever for, get, for her to get like a Facebook profile and I had to walk her through it. <laughs> and it was very hard for me to explain like, well, you can meet up with like all of the friends from college that you haven't seen for 20 years. And she's like, oh, but I don't know how long. <laughs> so I'm just kind of wondering like, is how much still, of an is issue? She, is she still resistant or is she? Well, she, she logs on like every few weeks and she goes, <laughs> oh. But she, she's very afraid of it, and I don't quite know why or how to help her. We're, well, well, we've always feared new technologies. I, I did a story in the mid-'90s about fights over um, cell phone towers. And I went back through the, the New York Times, actually, back 100 years ago. There were epic fights over power lines and you know, the telegraph cables. They were unsightly. They were going to ruin the, the, um, you know, the views. And, and now we don't even think about those, even as we were fighting you know, I wrote about this. There's a Segoro cactus cell tower somewhere in Arizona, and there's where I live. There are these fake kind of pine tree cell towers, and and then there's constant worry about them. But again, 100 years ago, the fights were over stuff that now we see as unremarkable. And I think Mark Twain. There are many people who wrote about the telephone killing discourse and being a terrible thing, and now you know it's something we don't even think about. So I think we're in a transition period, and for older people. It's maybe a little bit harder, but I, you know, I, I've seen many old people who have embraced the, the web. I have a 90-year-old um, aunt-in-law who's on there all the time. She, she's, you know, she, it's just an expansion of her knitting circle. <laughs> so, so it, you know, it depends on the person too. There, I know young people who are very resistant. Uh, one of my students in my blogging course, she doesn't want it. She hates Facebook. She'll, she'll blog, she'll do Twitter, but she hates Facebook just because I don't know why. So, you know, it's, it takes all varieties. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Hi. Um, I really liked you just had it up, the shape of climate knowledge and the way you talked about uncertainty. Yeah. Um, I often think this is an important point. It's often like the imprecision perhaps in future projections is something that opposition to change uses as a barrier to, yeah. to do more. So maybe just your thoughts on how we can better express uncertainty and use it as... Well, yeah, I think the, the basic, I think what needs to happen, especially for environmental campaigners, is to, to um, embrace the uncertainty where it's real, to, to actually say it's real, it's uh, not manufactured where it is, and then to aggressively, you know, point out the research uh, that, that, that gives shape to these different concepts and hypotheses, so that you can then start to kind of I've had countless discussions, either on the blog or in person, with, with quote-unquote skeptics, who, as soon as you engage with them in a constructive way, and sort of say, well, what is it about global warming that really, that you feel is, is alarmist or hype? And, and you dig in a little bit, and you'll find very quickly that it's some particular aspect of the issue, and most likely not the science, that has set that person off. And then you can start, as I said, to build some kind of actual conversation. And, and I, on my blog, there's um, a number of self-avowed skeptics who drive Priuses and who care deeply about energy efficiency and who hate the idea that we're sp spending a lot of money on imported oil, but who also say, if you're honest about this problem and you cross off nuclear power, you're, you're not realistic. Or if you're honest about this problem and you cross off natural gas, you're, you're not realistic. And so you, but then you're talking stuff. Then you're really talking. You're not just sort of yelling. 
So that's kind of, I think, where the potential lies. I don't have a Facebook account either, and I don't have a cell phone. And the reason is because no one really calls me much anymore. Oh. <laughs> and I don't want to talk to anybody who's trying to poke me every time I get online. <laughs> so it's useless. And some of the stuff that you ask you to put on there is just an invasion of privacy anyway. Yeah. You know, so there's a certain amount of risks in that. It's true. And uh, Facebook is free, essentially, but cell phones cost money, so why throw money away if you don't have to? But it wasn't until uh, 94, I think it was, I got an email account. And at the time, the public library where I used to live, they put in internet access for the public. Well, that was so new that I could stand at those terminals for three or four hours. Now you have to take a name and sign up in advance. Yeah. But it wasn't until it became relevant to me that I could get an email account and send one to my daughter, who had plenty of them where she works and everything. And I'd always come think of somebody. I got an email account, you know. Yeah. Here's the old man knows something. Wow. So and t until I can see how a lot of this technology is relevant, like Blackberries and all this other stuff, that I don't even think about it because it's not useful to me. If I can see it like blogs, well, who's going to read it if nobody calls? So sure. it's, it's, it's easier if, if they can find a way to make it relevant to the individual's life for the usefulness. If otherwise, like in school, there were only three or four teachers that made education and learning relevant. The rest of them just read the book or says, here, here's the test. And we just had to, like an educated man, he just answers what they want to hear. The learned man answers the way it ought to be. Right. So I had to find relevancy in all this technology. And if it's not relevant, I don't bother to hey. use it. Hey, Rusty? It's, uh, Rusty, it's Andy Revkin. <laughs> yeah, are you on video? Hold on. I'm talking to about 300 people at Iowa State University. There you go. Hi. I just wanted to show the power of Skype. I hope I'm not interrupting. <laughs> Anyone remember Rusty Schweikert, the astronaut? Anyone have any questions for him? <laughs> We're talking about the power of the internet to do cool uh, things. What, what have you wrapped me into here, Andy? No, I'll, I'll get, no. <laughs> this was totally unplanned. I just saw you were online. I'll say goodbye <laughs> if you want. <laughs> I like your beard. Oh, yeah, thank you. So any, I'll let you go. I just wanted to say hi and to show, to illustrate a point. Hello to everybody, whoever you are. <laughs> <laughs> if you care about near-Earth objects and avoiding asteroid collisions with the planet, Rusty is your guy. Right. Take, I'm, take I'm care. <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye. So, hello. <laughs> there's, there's enormous potential in this. Uh, again, I, when I'm teaching, I quite often will bring up, I'll notice someone is online, and I'll bring them into our classroom at the, t at the drop of a hat. Rusty Schweikert is an amazing man one of the Apollo astronauts who um, has worked really hard to build um, serious awareness of the risk that we face from asteroids striking the planet someday. So, and I could, you know, it's a, literally at a flick of a key, uh, you could say hi to him. Uh, luckily, he was dressed. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, I just wanted to get your opinion. The media often portrays this battle between jobs and the economy and the environment and it's a pick one you can't have both they don't empower each other it's that you can have a job yeah. or you can have a nice clean environment yeah. so i'm just wondering what are some of your strategies for dealing with that and making it clear to people that it's not a choice that they really do work together well if you know anytime someone lays out something as an either or issue you know there's some hype involved whatever the issues are it's almost guaranteed and we were just talking earlier today about uh, the different technologies, both traditional and non-traditional, for, for feeding a planet with 9 billion people. And anyone saying it's got to be all be organic or all technological genetic is not really being truthful to the complexity of the problem. But any, so, so I, I guess the first step is to say there's no such thing as an either or. I mean, be, you're either alive or you're dead. That's, that's one pretty sure bet. But other than that, there's not a lot of true either or situations. And that means... Again, embracing the reality that solutions, uh, as Bill McKibben says, you know, the silver bullet on these issues is not there. Silver buckshot is what's needed. And to do silver buckshot effectively, what you have to be doing is a lot of experimentation, a lot of innovation, a lot of practice. And it, as I was saying, remember what I said about the stroke? 
There it was, it, what's needed is an administrative innovation, not a new invention, not a new patent. So it's just a way of thinking. It's not a way of, it's not a technical thing. It's, it's just being motivated and, and engaged with the need to change things when they make sense. And uh, again, I think there's, so there's plenty of ways forward that get around those kinds of polarized situations. Unfortunately, our, our media and, and the blogosphere as well tend to be mostly waged from the edges, mostly shouting matches. And what I've tried to do on Dot Earth is create a different kind of a space. And it doesn't always succeed, but it's, again, it's an experiment. So the comment a uh, couple before was about how I'm not going to use the technology until it becomes relevant. Um, but once you can see the relevance, you might act. So I'm going to just switch it to the environment because it seems like that's a big one as well. I'm, the environment is out there, but it's until it's made relevant to me, mm. I'm not going to ask. I think there's a lot of people in this room that want to communicate these large scale things to a small perspective. And I'd like to ask you to speak. How do you do that? Well. That is a really good question, especially when you think about the digital world. What I liked about um, Marion Rebega's um, class on bird biology is it's kind of digital and analog. It's using experience with the physical, biological world and tr translating it through that digital medium. And that there's many ways to do that with young people. Um, I'm just going to show you one example. My uh, younger son, who's 13 now, when he was around nine, uh, I was con uh, rowing with him um, in a very developed part of Florida. We were going to go see some herons, and let's see if this works. Yeah. And he, he took out the video camera. I was doing the hard work of rowing. Good morning. Uh, we're in Stewart, Florida. It's April 22nd, Earth Day. It's like the 38th Earth Day. And Growing with my son Jack to go see some birds that we saw yesterday up a little mangrove creek here in the middle of Florida style suburban sprawl. So Jack's got the camera. Which is a lot of houses on a lot of little waterways. Nature is kind of interesting. It still fills in the blanks here. All right, I'm going to fast forward. So now, now he's like searching. There was this heron Those nest. Are the babies. <gasps> oh, yes, there they are. There they are. Move back, move back. I just saw one. Move over a little, I can't see it. Get out of the way, Dad. Yeah, just move them like that. Hello, little birdies. Yes, 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 it's on the camera. Okay. That's a baby tricolored heron. They are cute. So, did you hear his voice? It's like that same thing. I can hear the voice of the that. kids, no, you know, with the breaking bridges. Here. His voice there, you know, his eye that saw the thing I couldn't see. And that'll stay with him forever. And then he's shared that experience. I mean, it's only been seen by 7,000 people, so it's not like a Madonna or Lady Gaga or something. But kids can be trading experiences like that in a digital way, but that also include that direct connection with something they saw in the real world. And I think. Finding those hybrid experiences uh, is, is a way forward. And that is a cool bird. <laughs> so um, I, I'm easy to find. Re remember, Revkin at Gmail. If you have any uh, other questions that come up later, uh, .earth is easy to find as well. Just Google for Revkin, and you'll stumble on the blog. And I really appreciate your giving me the time here. And I'm going to go out and see an ethanol plant tomorrow and some tiled landscapes. and some corn stubble, and I appreciate being here. So thank you again. Thank you. We uh, have some refreshments in the back of the room, and uh, please continue to visit. <laughs>